The Sages of India In speaking of the Sages of India, my mind goes back to those periods of which history has no record, and tradition tries in vain to bring the secrets out of the gloom of the past. The Sages of India have been almost innumerable, for what has the Hindu nation been doing for thousands of years except producing sages? I will take, therefore, the lives of a few of the most brilliant ones, the epoch makers, and present them before you, that is to say, my study of them. In the first place, we have to understand a little about our scriptures. Two ideals of truth are in our scriptures, the one is, what we call the eternal, and the other is not so authoritative, yet binding under particular circumstances, times, and places. The eternal relations which deal with the nature of the soul and of God and the relations between souls and God are embodied in what we call the Shrutis, the Vedas. The next set of truths is what we call the Smritis, as embodied in the words of Manu. Yajnavalkya and other writers and also in the Puranas down to the Tantras. The second class of books and teachings is subordinate to the Shrutis, Inasmuch as whenever any one of these contradicts anything in the Shrutis, the Shrutis must prevail. This is the law. The idea is that the framework of the destiny and goal of man has been all delineated in the Vedas, the details have been left to be worked out in the Smritis and Puranas. As for general directions, the Shrutis are enough. For spiritual life, nothing more can be said, nothing more can be known. All that is necessary has been known, all the advice that is necessary to lead the soul to perfection has been completed in the Shrutis, the details alone were left out, and these the Smritis have supplied from time to time. Another peculiarity is that these Shrutis have many sages as the recorders of the truths in them, mostly men, even some women. Very little is known of their personalities, the dates of their birth, and so forth, but their best thoughts, their best discoveries, I should say, are preserved there, embodied in the sacred literature of our country, the Vedas. In the Smritis, on the other hand, personalities are more in evidence. Startling, gigantic, impressive, world-moving persons stand before us, as it were, for the first time, sometimes of more magnitude even than their teachings. This is a peculiarity which we have to understand, that our religion preaches an impersonal personal God. It preaches any amount of impersonal laws plus any amount of personality, but the very fountainhead of our religion is in the Shrutis, the Vedas, which are perfectly impersonal, the persons all come in the Smritis and Puranas, the great avatars, incarnations of God, prophets, and so forth. And this ought also to be observed that except our religion, every other religion in the world depends upon the life or lives of some personal founder or founders. Christianity is built upon the life of Jesus Christ, Mohammedanism upon Muhammad, Buddhism upon Buddha, Jainism upon the Jinas, and so on. It naturally follows that there must be in all these religions a good deal of fight about what they call the historical evidences of these great personalities. If at any time the historical evidences about the existence of these personages in ancient times become weak, the whole building of the religion tumbles down and is broken to pieces. We escaped this fate because our religion is not based upon persons but on principles. That you obey your religion is not because it came through the authority of a sage, no, not even of an incarnation. Krishna is not the authority of the Vedas, but the Vedas are the authority of Krishna himself. His glory is that he is the greatest preacher of the Vedas that ever existed. So with the other incarnations, so with all our sages. Our first principle is that all that is necessary for the perfection of man and for attaining unto freedom is there in the Vedas. You cannot find anything new. You cannot go beyond a perfect unity, 
which is the goal of all knowledge, this has been already reached there and it is impossible to go beyond the unity. Religious knowledge became complete when Tat Tvamasi, the art that, was discovered and that was in the Vedas. What remained was the guidance of people from time to time according to different times and places, according to different circumstances and environments, people had to be guided along the old, old path. And for this these great teachers came, these great sages. Nothing can bear out more clearly this position than the celebrated saying of Shri Krishna in the Gita, whenever virtue subsides and irreligion prevails, I create myself for the protection of the good, for the destruction of all immorality I am coming from time to time. This is the idea in India. What follows? That on the one hand, there are these eternal principles which stand upon their own foundations without depending on any reasoning even, much less on the authority of sages however great, of incarnations however brilliant they may have been. We may remark that as this is the unique position in India, our claim is that the Vedanta only can be the universal religion, that it is already the existing universal religion in the world, because it teaches principles and not persons. No religion built upon a person can be taken up as a type by all the races of mankind. In our own country we find that there have been so many grand characters, in even a small city many persons are taken up as types by the different minds in that one city. How is it possible that one person as Muhammad or Buddha or Christ can be taken up as the one type for the whole world, nay, that the whole of morality, ethics, spirituality and religion can be true only from the sanction of that one person and one person alone? Now, the Vedantic religion does not require any such personal authority. Its sanction is the eternal nature of man, its ethics are based upon the eternal spiritual solidarity of man, already existing, already attained and not to be attained. On the other hand, from the very earliest times, our sages have been feeling conscious of this fact that the vast majority of mankind require a personality. They must have a personal God in some form or other. The very Buddha who declared against the existence of a personal God had not died fifty years before his disciples manufactured a personal God out of him. The personal God is necessary, and at the same time we know that instead of and better than vain imaginations of a personal God, which in 99 cases out of a hundred are unworthy of human worship we have in this world, living and walking in our midst, living gods, now and then. These are more worthy of worship than any imaginary god, any creation of our imagination, that is to say, any idea of god which we can form. Shri Krishna is much greater than any idea of god you or I can have. Buddha is a much higher idea, a more living and idealized idea, than the ideal you or I can conceive of in our minds, and therefore it is that they always command the worship of mankind even to the exclusion of all imaginary deities. This our sages knew, and therefore, left it open to all Indian people to worship such great personages, such incarnations. Nay, the greatest of these incarnations goes further, wherever an extraordinary spiritual power is manifested by external man, know that I am there, it is from me that that manifestation comes. That leaves the door open for the Hindu to worship the incarnations of all the countries in the world. The Hindu can worship any sage and any saint from any country whatsoever, and as a fact we know that we go and worship many times in the churches of the Christians, and many, many times in the Mohammedan mosques, and that is good. Why not? Ours, as I have said, is the universal religion. It is inclusive enough, it is broad enough to include all the ideals. All the ideals of religion that already exist in the world can be immediately included, 
and we can patiently wait for all the ideals that are to come in the future to be taken in the same fashion, embraced in the infinite arms of the religion of the Vedanta. This, more or less, is our position with regard to the great sages, the incarnations of God. There are also secondary characters. We find the word Rishi again and again mentioned in the Vedas, and it has become a common word at the present time. The Rishi is the great authority. We have to understand that idea. The definition is that the Rishi is the Mantradrishta, the seer of thought. What is the proof of religion? This was asked in very ancient times. There is no proof in the senses was the declaration, from whence words reflect back with thought without reaching the goal. There the eyes cannot reach, neither can speech, nor the mind that has been the declaration for ages and ages. Nature outside cannot give us any answer as to the existence of the soul, the existence of God, the eternal life, the goal of man, and all that. This mind is continually changing, always in a state of flux, it is finite, it is broken into pieces. How can nature tell of the infinite, the unchangeable, the unbroken, the indivisible, the eternal? It never can. And whenever mankind has striven to get an answer from dull dead matter, history shows how disastrous the results have been. How comes, then, the knowledge which the Vedas declare? It comes through being a Rishi. This knowledge is not in the senses, but are the senses the be-all and the end-all of the human being? Who dare say that the senses are the all-in-all -all of man? Even in our lives, in the life of every one of us here, there come moments of calmness, perhaps, when we see before us the death of one we loved, when some shock comes to us, or when extreme blessedness comes to us. Many other occasion there are when the mind, as it were, becomes calm, feels for the moment its real nature, and a glimpse of the infinite beyond, where words cannot reach nor the mind go, is revealed to us. This happens in ordinary life, but it has to be heightened, practiced, perfected. Men found out ages ago that the soul is not bound or limited by the senses, no, not even by consciousness. We have to understand that this consciousness is only the name of one link in the infinite chain. Being is not identical with consciousness, but consciousness is only one part of being. Beyond consciousness is where the bold search lies. Consciousness is bound by the senses. Beyond that, beyond the senses, men must go in order to arrive at truths of the spiritual world, and there are even now persons who succeed in going beyond the bounds of the senses. These are called rishis because they come face to face with spiritual truths. The proof, therefore, of the Vedas is just the same as the proof of this table before me, Pratyaksha, direct perception. This I see with the senses, and the truths of spirituality we also see in a superconscious state of the human soul. This Rishi state is not limited by time or place, by sex or race. Vatsyayana boldly declares that this Rishihood is the common property of the descendants of the sage, of the Aryan, of the non-Aryan, of even the Mlechta. This is the sageship of the Vedas, and constantly we ought to remember this ideal of religion in India, which I wish other nations of the world would also remember and learn, so that there may be less fight and less quarrel. Religion is not in books, nor in theories, nor in dogmas, nor in talking, not even in reasoning. It is being and becoming. A. My friends, until each one of you has become a Rishi and come face to face with spiritual facts, religious life has not begun for you. Until the superconscious opens for you, religion is mere talk. It is nothing but preparation. You are talking second hand, third hand, and here applies that beautiful saying of Buddha when he had a discussion with some Brahmins. They came discussing about the nature of Brahman, and the great sage asked, 
Have you seen Brahman? No, said the Brahman or your father. No, neither has he or your grandfather. I don't think even he saw him. My friend, how can you discuss about a person whom your father and grandfather never saw and try to put each other down? That is what the whole world is doing. Let us say in the language of the Vedanta, this Atman is not to be reached by too much talk, no, not even by the highest intellect, no, not even by the study of the Vedas themselves. Let us speak to all the nations of the world in the language of the Vedas. When are your fights and your quarrels? Have you seen God whom you want to preach? If you have not seen, when is your preaching? You do not know what you say. And if you have seen God, you will not quarrel, your very face will shine. An ancient sage of the Upanishads sent his son out to learn about Brahman, and the child came back, and the father asked, What have you learnt? The child replied, He had learnt so many sciences. But the father said, That is nothing, go back. And the son went back, and when he returned again, the father asked the same question, and the same answer came from the child. Once more he had to go back. And the next time he came, his whole face was shining, and his father stood up and declared, A, today, my child, your face shines like a knower of Brahman. When you have known God, your very face will be changed, your voice will be changed, your whole appearance will he changed. You will be a blessing to mankind, none will be able to resist the Rishi. This is the Rishihood, the ideal in our religion. The rest, all these talks and reasonings and philosophies and dualisms and monisms and even the Vedas themselves are but preparations, secondary things. The other is primary. The Vedas, grammar, astronomy, etc., all these are secondary, that is supreme knowledge which makes us realize the unchangeable one. Those who realized are the sages whom we find in the Vedas, and we understand how this Rishi is the name of a type, of a class, which every one of us, as true Hindus, is expected to become at some period of our life, and becoming which, to the Hindu, means salvation. Not belief in doctrines, not going to thousands of temples, nor bathing in all the rivers in the world, but becoming the Rishi, the Mantra Drishta, that is freedom, that is salvation. Coming down to later times, there have been great world-moving sages, great incarnations of whom there have been many, and according to the Bhagavata, they also are infinite in number, and those that are worshipped most in India are Rama and Krishna. Rama, the ancient idol of the heroic ages, the embodiment of truth, of morality, the ideal son, the ideal husband, the ideal father, and above all, the ideal king, this Rama has been presented before us by the great sage Valmiki. No language can be purer, none chaster, none more beautiful and at the same time simpler than the language in which the great poet has depicted the life of Rama. And what to speak of Sita? You may exhaust the literature of the world that is past, and I may assure you that you will have to exhaust the literature of the world of the future before finding another Sita. Sita is unique, that character was depicted once and for all. There may have been several Ramas, perhaps, but never more than one Sita. She is the very type of the true Indian woman, for all the Indian ideals of a perfected woman have grown out of that one life of Sita, and here she stands these thousands of years, commanding the worship of every man, woman, and child throughout the length and breadth of the land of Aryavart. There she will always be, this glorious Sita, purer than purity itself, all patience and all suffering. She who suffered that life of suffering without a murmur, she the ever chaste and ever pure wife, she the ideal of the people, the ideal of the gods, the great Sita, our national god she must always remain. And every one of us knows her too well to require much delineation. 
all our mythology may vanish, even our Vedas may depart, and our Sanskrit language may vanish forever, but so long as there will be five Hindus living here, even if only speaking the most vulgar patois, there will be the story of Sita present. Mark my words, Sita has gone into the very vitals of our race. She is there in the blood of every Hindu man and woman. We are all children of Sita. Any attempt to modernize our women, if it tries to take our women away from that ideal of Sita, is immediately a failure as we see every day. The women of India must grow and develop in the footprints of Sita, and that is the only way. The next is he who is worshipped in various forms, the favourite ideal of men as well as of women, the ideal of children as well as of grown-up men. I mean he whom the writer of the Bhagavata was not content to call an incarnation but says, the other incarnations were but parts of the Lord. He, Krishna, was the Lord Himself. And it is not strange that such adjectives are applied to Him when we marvel at the manicidedness of His character. He was the most wonderful sannyasin and the most wonderful householder in one, He had the most wonderful amount of rajas, power, and was at the same time living in the midst of the most wonderful renunciation. Krishna can never he understood until you have studied the Gita, for he was the embodiment of his own teaching. Every one of these incarnations came as a living illustration of what they came to preach. Krishna, the preacher of the Gita, was all his life the embodiment of that song celestial, he was the great illustration of non-attachment. He gives up his throne and never cares for it. He, the leader of India, at whose word kings come down from their thrones, never wants to be a king. He is the simple Krishna, ever the same Krishna who played with the gopis. Ah, that most marvellous passage of his life, the most difficult to understand, and which none ought to attempt to understand until he has become perfectly chaste and pure, that most marvellous expansion of love, allegorized and expressed in that beautiful play at Vrindavan, which none can understand but he who has become mad with love, drunk deep of the cup of love. Who can understand the throes of the lore of the gopis, the very ideal of love, love that wants nothing, love that even does not care for heaven, love that does not care for anything in this world or the world to come. And here, my friends, through this love of the gopis has been found the only solution of the conflict between the personal and the impersonal God. We know how the personal God is the highest point of human life. We know that it is philosophical to believe in an impersonal God immanent in the universe, of whom everything is but a manifestation. At the same time our souls hanker after something concrete, something which we want to grasp, at whose feet we can pour out our soul, and so on. The personal God is therefore the highest conception of human nature. Yet reason stands aghast at such an idea. It is the same old, old question which you find discussed in the Brahma Sutras, which you find Draupadi discussing with Yudhishthira in the forest, if there is a personal God, all-merciful, all-powerful, why is the hell of an earth here? Why did He create this? He must be a partial God. There was no solution, and the only solution that can be found is what you read about the love of the gopis. They hated every adjective that was applied to Krishna, they did not care to know that He was the Lord of creation, they did not care to know that He was Almighty, they did not care to know that He was Omnipotent, and so forth. The only thing they understood was that He was infinite love, that was all. The gopis understood Krishna only as the Krishna of Vrindavan. He, the leader of the hosts, the king of kings, to them was the shepherd, and the shepherd forever. I do not want wealth, nor many people, nor do I want learning, no, not even do I want to go to heaven. Let one be born again and again, but Lord, grant me this, 
that I may have love for thee, and that for love's sake. A great landmark in the history of religion is here, the ideal of love for love's sake, work for work's sake, duty for duty's sake, and it for the first time fell from the lips of the greatest of incarnations, Krishna, and for the first time in the history of humanity, upon the soil of India. The religions of fear and of temptations were gone for ever, and in spite of the fear of hell and temptation of enjoyment in heaven, came the grandest of ideals, love for love's sake, duty for duty's sake, work for work's sake, and what a love. I have told you just now that it is very difficult to understand the love of the gopis. There are not wanting fools, even in the midst of us, who cannot understand the marvellous significance of that most marvellous of all episodes. There are, let me repeat, impure fools, even born of our blood, who try to shrink from that as if from something impure. To them I have only to say, first make yourselves pure, and you must remember that he who tells the history of the love of the gopis is none else but Shukadeva. The historian who records this marvellous love of the gopis is one who was born pure, the eternally pure Shuka, the son of Vyasa. So long as there its selfishness in the heart, so long is love of God impossible, it is nothing but shopkeeping, I give you something, O Lord, you give me something in return, and says the Lord, if you do not do this, I will take good care of you when you die. I will roast you all the rest of your lives. Perhaps, and so on. So long as such ideas are in the brain, how can one understand the mad throes of the gopis' love? Oh, for one, one kiss of those lips. One who has been kissed by thee, his thirst for thee increases forever, all sorrows vanish, and he forgets love for everything else but for thee and thee alone. A. Forget first the love for gold, and name and fame, and for this little trumpery world of ours. Then, only then, you will understand the love of the gopis, too holy to be attempted without giving up everything, too sacred co be understood until the soul has become perfectly pure. People with ideas of sex, and of money, and of fame, bubbling up every minute in the heart, daring to criticize and understand the love of the gopis. That is the very essence of the Krishna incarnation. Even the Gita, the great philosophy itself, does not compare with that madness, for in the Gita the disciple is taught slowly how to walk towards the goal. But here is the madness of enjoyment, the drunkenness of love, where disciples and teachers and teachings and books and all these things have become one, even the ideas of fear and God and heaven, everything has been thrown away. What remains is the madness of love. It is forgetfulness of everything, and the lover sees nothing in the world except that Krishna and Krishna alone, when the face of every being becomes a Krishna, when his own face looks like Krishna, when his own soul has become tinged with the Krishna color. That was the great Krishna. Do not waste your time upon little details. Take up the framework, the essence of the life. There may be many historical discrepancies, there may be interpolations in the life of Krishna. All these things may be true, but at the same time, there must have been a basis, a foundation for this new and tremendous departure. Taking the life of any other sage or prophet, we find that that prophet is only the evolution of what had gone before him, we find that that prophet is only preaching the ideas that had been scattered about his own country even in his own times. Great doubts may exist even as to whether that prophet existed or not. But here, I challenge anyone to show whether these things, these ideals, work for work's sake, love for love's sake, duty for duty's sake, were not original ideas with Krishna, and as such, there must have been someone with whom these ideas originated. They could not have been borrowed from anybody else. 
They were not floating about in the atmosphere when Krishna was born. But the Lord Krishna was the first preacher of this. His disciple Vyasa took it up and preached it unto mankind. This is the highest idea to picture. The highest thing we can get out of him is Gopijnavalabha, the beloved of the gopis of Vrindavan. When that madness comes in your brain, when you understand the blessed gopis, then you will understand what love is. When the whole world will vanish, when all other considerations will have died out, when you will become pure-hearted with no other aim, not even the search after truth, then and then alone will come to you the madness of that love, the strength and the power of that infinite love which the gopis had, that love for love's sake. That is the goal. When you have got that, you have got everything. To come down to the lower stratum, Krishna, the preacher of the Gita. A. There is an attempt in India now which is like putting the cart before the horse. Many of our people think that Krishna as the lover of the gopis is something rather uncanny and the Europeans do not like it much. Dr. So and so does not like it. Certainly then, the gopis have to go. Without the sanction of Europeans, how can Krishna live? He cannot. In the Mahabharata there is no mention of the gopis except in one or two places and those not very remarkable places. In the prayer of Draupadi there is mention of a Vrindavan life and in the speech of Shishupala there is again mention of this Vrindavan. All these are interpolations. What the Europeans do not want must be thrown off. They are interpolations, the mention of the gopis and of Krishna too. Well, with these men, steeped in commercialism, where even the ideal of religion has become commercial, they are all trying to go to heaven by doing something here. The Banya wants compound interest, wants to lay by something here and enjoy it there. Certainly the gopis have no place in such a system of thought. From that ideal lover we come down to the lower stratum of Krishna, the preacher of the Gita. Then the Gita no better commentary on the Vedas has been written or can be written. The essence of the Shrutis or of the Upanishads is hard to be understood seeing that there are so many commentators, each one trying to interpret in his own way. Then the Lord Himself comes, He who is the inspirer of the Shrutis, to show us the meaning of them as the preacher of the Gita and today India wants nothing better, the world wants nothing better than that method of interpretation. It is a wonder that subsequent interpreters of the scriptures, even commenting upon the Gita, many times could not catch the meaning, many times could not catch the drift. For what do you find in the Gita? And what in modern commentators? One non-dualistic commentator takes up an Upanishad. There are so many dualistic passages and he twists and tortures them into some meaning and wants to bring them all into a meaning of his own. If a dualistic commentator comes, there are so many non-dualistic texts which he begins to torture to bring them all round to dualistic meaning. But you find in the Gita there is no attempt at torturing any one of them. They are all right, says the Lord, for slowly and gradually the human soul rises up and up, step after step, from the gross to the fine, from the fine to the finer, until it reaches the absolute, the goal. That is what is in the Gita. Even the Karma Kanda is taken up, and it is shown that although it cannot give salvation direct but only indirectly, yet that is also valid, images are valid indirectly, ceremonies, forms, everything is valid only with one condition, purity of the heart. For worship is valid and leads to the goal if the heart is pure and the heart is sincere and all these various modes of worship are necessary, else why should they be there? Religions and sects are not the work of hypocrites and wicked people who invented all these to get a little money, as some of our modern men want to think. However reasonable that explanation may seem, it is not true, 
and they were not invented that way at all. They are the outcome of the necessity of the human soul. They are all here to satisfy the hankering and thirst of different classes of human minds and you need not preach against them. The day when that necessity will cease, they will vanish along with the cessation of that necessity and so long as that necessity remains, they must be there in spite of your preaching, in spite of your criticism. You may bring the sword or the gun into play, you may deluge the world with human blood, but so long as there is a necessity for idols, they must remain. These forms and all the various steps in religion will remain, and we understand from the Lord Shri Krishna why they should. A rather sadder chapter of India's history comes now. In the Gita we already hear the distant sound of the conflicts of sects, and the Lord comes in the middle to harmonize them all, He, the great preacher of harmony, the greatest teacher of harmony, Lord Shri Krishna. He says, In me they are all strung like pearls upon a thread. We already hear the distant sounds, the murmurs of the conflict, and possibly there was a period of harmony and calmness, when it broke out anew, not only on religious grounds, but roost possibly on caste grounds, the fight between the two powerful factors in our community, the kings and the priests. And from the topmost crest of the wave that deluged India for nearly a thousand years, we see another glorious figure, and that was our Gautama Shakyamuni. You all know about his teachings and preachings. We worship him as God incarnate, the greatest, the boldest preacher of morality that the world ever saw, the greatest karmayogi, as disciple of himself, as it were, the same Krishna came to show how to make his theories practical. There came once again the same voice that in the Gita preached, even the least bit done of this religion saves from great fear. Women, or Vaishyas, or even Shudras, all reach the highest goal. Breaking the bondages of all, the chains of all, declaring liberty to all to reach the highest goal, come the words of the Gita, rolls like thunder the mighty voice of Krishna, even in this life they have conquered relativity, whose minds are firmly fixed upon the sameness, for God is pure and the same to all, therefore such are said to be living in God. Thus seeing the same Lord equally present everywhere, the sage does not injure the self by the self and thus reaches the highest goal, as it were to give a living example of this preaching, as it were to make at least one part of it practical, the preacher himself came in another form, and this was Shakyamuni, the preacher to the poor and the miserable, he who rejected even the language of the gods to speak in the language of the people, so that he might reach the hearts of the people, he who gave up a throne to live with beggars, and the poor, and the downcast, he who pressed the paria to his breast like a second Rama. You all know about his great work, his grand character. But the work had one great defect, and for that we are suffering even today. No blame attaches to the Lord. He is pure and glorious, but unfortunately such high ideals could not be well assimilated by the different uncivilized and uncultured races of mankind who flocked within the fold of the Aryans. These races, with varieties of superstition and hideous worship, rushed within the fold of the Aryans and for a time appeared as if they had become civilized, but before a century had passed they brought out their snakes, their ghosts and all the other things their ancestors used to worship, and thus the whole of India became one degraded mass of superstition. The earlier Buddhists in their rage against the killing of animals had denounced the sacrifices of the Vedas, and these sacrifices used to be held in every house. There was a fire burning, and that was all the paraphernalia of worship. These sacrifices were obliterated, and in their place came gorgeous temples, gorgeous ceremonies and gorgeous priests and all that you see in India in modern times. I smile when I read books written by some modern people who ought to have known better, 
that the Buddha was the destroyer of Brahmanical idolatry. Little do they know that Buddhism created Brahmanism and idolatry in India. There was a book written a year or two ago by a Russian gentleman who claimed to have found out a very curious life of Jesus Christ and in one part of the book he says that Christ went to the temple of Jagannath to study with the Brahmans but became disgusted with their exclusiveness and their idols and so he went to the Lamas of Tibet instead, became perfect and went home. To any man who knows anything about Indian history, that very statement proves that the whole thing was a fraud because the temple of Jagannath is an old Buddhistic temple. We took this and others over and re hinduist them. We shall have to do many things like that yet. That is Jagannath, and there was not one Brahman there then, and yet we are told that Jesus Christ came to study with the Brahmans there. So says our great Russian archaeologist. Thus, in spite of the preaching of mercy to animals, in spite of the sublime ethical religion, in spite of the hair-splitting discussions about the existence or non-existence of a permanent soul, the whole building of Buddhism tumbled down piecemeal and the ruin was simply hideous. I have neither the time nor the inclination to describe to you the hideousness that came in the wake of Buddhism. The most hideous ceremonies, the most horrible, the most obscene books that human hands ever wrote or the human brain ever conceived, the most bestial forms that ever passed under the name of religion, have all been the creation of degraded Buddhism. But India has to live, and the Spirit of the Lords descended again. He who declared, I will come whenever virtue subsides, came again, and this time the manifestation was in the South, and up rose that young Brahman of whom it has been declared that at the age of sixteen he had completed all his writings, the marvellous boy Shankaracharya arose. The writings of this boy of sixteen are the wonders of the modern world, and so was the boy. He wanted to bring back the Indian world to its pristine purity, but think of the amount of the task before him. I have told you a few points about the state of things that existed in India. All these horrors that you are trying to reform are the outcome of that reign of degradation. The Tatars and the Baluchis and all the hideous races of mankind came to India and became Buddhists and assimilated with us and brought their national customs and the whole of our national life became a huge page of the most horrible and the most bestial customs. That was the inheritance which that boy got from the Buddhists and from that time to this, the whole work in India is a reconquest of this Buddhistic degradation by the Vedanta. It is still going on, it is not yet finished. Shankara came, a great philosopher, and showed that the real essence of Buddhism and that of the Vedanta are not very different, but that the disciples did not understand the Master and have degraded themselves, denied the existence of the soul and of God, and have become atheists. That was what Shankara showed, and all the Buddhists began to come back to the old religion. But then they had become accustomed to all these forms, what could be done? Then came the brilliant Ramanus. Shankara, with his great intellect, I am afraid, had not as great a heart. Ramanuj's heart was greater. He felt for the downtrodden, he sympathized with them. He took up the ceremonies, the accretions that had gathered, made them pure so far as they could be, and instituted new ceremonies, new methods of worship, for the people who absolutely required them. At the same time he opened the door to the highest, spiritual worship from the Brahman to the Pariya. That was Ramanuj's work. That work rolled on, invaded the north, was taken up by some great leaders there, but that was much later, during the Muhammadan rule, and the brightest of these prophets of comparatively modern times in the north was Chaitanya. You may mark one characteristic since the time of Ramanuj, the opening of the door of spirituality to everyone. That has been the watchword of all prophets succeeding Ramanuj 
as it had been the watchword of all the prophets before Shankara. I do not know why Shankara should be represented as rather exclusive, I do not find anything in his writings which is exclusive. As in the case of the declarations of the Lord Buddha, this exclusiveness that has been attributed to Shankara's teachings is most possibly not due to his teachings, but to the incapacity of his disciples. This one great northern sage, Chaitanya, represented the mad love of the gopis. Himself a Brahman, born of one of the most rationalistic families of the day, himself a professor of logic fighting and gaining a word victory for, this he had learnt from his childhood as the highest ideal of life and yet through the mercy of some sage the whole life of that man became changed, he gave up his fight, his quarrels, his professorship of logic and became one of the greatest teachers of bhakti the world has ever known, Mad Chaitanya. His bhakti rolled over the whole land of Bengal, bringing solace to everyone. His love knew no bounds. The saint or the sinner, the Hindu or the Mohammedan, the pure or the impure, the prostitute, the streetwalker, all had a share in his love, all had a share in his mercy, and even to the present day, although greatly degenerated, as everything does become in time, his sect is the refuge of the poor, of the downtrodden, of the outcast, of the weak, of those who have been rejected by all society. But at the same time I must remark for truth's sake that we find this. In the philosophic sects we find wonderful liberalisms. There is not a man who follows Shankara who will say that all the different sects of India are really different. At the same time, he was a tremendous upholder of exclusiveness as regards caste. But with every Vaishnavite preacher, we find a wonderful liberalism as to the teaching of caste questions, but exclusiveness as regards religious questions. The one had a great head, the other a large heart, and the time was ripe for one to be born, the embodiment of both this head and heart. The time was ripe for one to be born who in one body would have the brilliant intellect of Shankara and the wonderfully expansive, infinite heart of Chaitanya, one who would see in every sect the same spirit working, the same God, one who would see God in every being, one whose heart would weep for the poor, for the weak, for the outcast, for the downtrodden. For everyone in this world, inside India or outside India, and at the same time whose grand brilliant intellect would conceive of such noble thoughts as would harmonize all conflicting sects, not only in India but outside of India, and bring a marvelous harmony, the universal religion of head and heart into existence. Such a man was born, and I had the good fortune to sit at his feet for years. The time was ripe, it was necessary that such a man should be born, and he came, and the most wonderful part of it was that his life's work was just near a city which was full of Western thought, a city which had run mad after these Occidental ideas, a city which had become more Europeanized than any other city in India. There he lived, without any book learning whatsoever, this great intellect never learnt even to write his own name, asterisk, but the most graduates of our university found in him an intellectual giant. He was a strange man, this Sri Ramakrishna Parmahamsa. It is a long, long story, and I have no time to tell anything about him tonight. Let me now only mention the great Sri Ramakrishna, the fulfilment of the Indian sages, the sage for the time, one whose teaching is just now, in the present time, most beneficial. And mark the divine power working behind the man. The son of a poor priest, born in and out of Dave village, unknown and unthought of, today is worshipped literally by thousands in Europe and America, and tomorrow will be worshipped by thousands more. Who knows the plans of the Lord? Now, my brothers, if you do not see the hand, the finger of providence, it is because you are blind, born blind indeed. If time comes, and another opportunity, I will speak to you more fully about him. 
Only let me say now that if I have told you one word of truth, it was His and His alone, and if I have told you many things which were not true, which were not correct, which were not beneficial to the human race, they were all mine, and on me is the responsibility.